Hello everyone and thank you very much for tuning back into my channel. Today I'm going to be introducing you to an, another favourite of mine. Um, this one has been with me for quite a long time. Uh, I've been playing this game since 2001, haven't lost my taste for it and I doubt many others who have taken this uh, highly addictive air combat game up uh, will, will say they'd be willing to let it go easily either and the game I'm talking about is of course uh, Down in Flames. I'm not going to be discussing the Dan Verson Games version but rather the GMT equivalent. Same designer but slightly different versions produced by different companies. So. Just a bit of background because this game is rather long in the tooth now. Every now and then humanity benefits from something amazing that just appears and does everyone a power of good. Um, penicillin, the discovery that you could put pineapple on pizza and it's amazing. Well in 1992 something new hit the gaming shelves uh, and it was called Down in Flames. Um, it was a very unique air combat card game. Uh, most air combat simulations were still board or model based. And what this did was introduce the notion of using cards to represent individual aircraft and additional cards to control their actions. Now, volume one of the game was called Rise of the Luftwaffe and dealt with the early successful years of the German Air Force in World War II. It gave players the option of either fighting individual dogfights or of playing through specific campaigns such as Poland, the fall of France, the Battle of Britain and the early battles of the Russian Front and the Mediterranean. So effectively the initial successful arc of the German war effort in the air um, up to the mid-war period. I did really well and it was followed a couple of years later by an expansion called 8th Air Force in the mid-90s. Um, 8th Air Force brought in the US and British bombing efforts, um, the assaults on the Third Reich by the much strengthened Russian Air Force in the late war period and effectively carried the story of the war in the air from the mid-war period in Europe to the end of the war in Europe. Now a logical follow-on from this, and this is where I came into playing this game in 2001, was when they brought in this lovely beast, um, Zero, the rise and fall of the Imperial Japanese Air Force. That makes me twitch slightly because of course Japan, unlike less sensible nations, eschewed the notion of having an independent air force and much more sensibly everything that they possessed that flew operated as a component of either the army or the navy. There was none of this wasteful centralization of air assets. I mean, really ridiculous. But that's a whole other debate. I'm going to leave that one there. Um, this followed the same uh, game system, but it took the war to the Far East. And as you can see from the dates, it followed the arc of the European games in that this volume, volume three, covered the initial successes of the Japanese air arms um, up to the Battle of Midway. Um, what is notable is if you look at the samples on the back of the box, the quality of the aircraft card art compared to the monochrome um, of Rise of the Luftwaffe and the very light colouring of 8th Air Force um, had given way to this real, real increase in quality and game attractiveness. Uh, needless to say, Zero did extremely well and was followed in fairly swift order by Corsairs and Hellcats. Again, that rather amazing uh, quality and following the same pattern, the first volume deals with the success of Axis arms. The ensuing one deals with the mid-war period and the subsequent assaults on the crumbling uh, Japanese Empire, primarily by the United States, but the Allies are also included in this. Um, there are modules for the British Pacific Fleet, for instance. Time passed and the inevitable happened, and gone 2010, you could still buy these games, but they were increasingly hard to find and they were out of print fairly soon, which was a bit of a shame. However, in 2017, GMT Games came through with this beautiful monster. 
Wild Blue Yonder, which in some senses is a gorgeous, gorgeous rehash of Rise of the Luftwaffe and 8th Air Force in one enormous box, um, but in other ways reflected all the improvements that have been thought out in the ensuing years. So to their credit, GMT had paid attention to what fans of the game wanted. Um, they'd taken on board suggested improvements. There are many new optional rules to make gameplay not just more fun, but also more realistic. And as a final bonus, they made sure that the rules were applicable in reverse to earlier titles. So if you wanted to, you could play Zero using the improvements in the generic rules introduced in Wild Blue Yonder. I'm crossing my fingers and praying, praying fervently that the Pacific version of this game is not too far behind. Now, I'm going to be putting up what I hope a live stream soon in order to demonstrate um, how amazing this game is in play and why I like it so much. But before I stop here, I'm just going to show you some of the components because these are absolutely amazing compared to the original Rise of the Luftwaffe. So the core element of the game is the aircraft cards. Of course, we have a first generation British Hurricane here with a early war German Messerschmitt. And they're very simple to interpret because all you need to know is the aircraft performance is your hand size in action cards. Your burst rating is how is an amalgamation of how many guns your aircraft possesses and what caliber they are. It's just rolled into that one figure. Your horsepower, effectiveness of your engine, obviously, uh, it varies by different altitudes, but that is how many cards you draw at the end of the turn. Your aircraft's maximum attainable altitude, how much damage it can absorb once it endures three hits. It's flicked to its damaged side. Hits are carried over. And once it suffers that number of hits, it's shot down. You can see, of course, on the damaged side, its various ratings are reduced. So a very elegant and simple and, I must say, very good looking system. Just look at that card art. Awesome. The action cards are equally good. You get this beautiful deck, um, blue for allied, red for axis. Um, red action cards are taken on the player's turn. In this case, half loop in order to gain an advantageous position over your opponent. Blue are response cards, which you play during your enemy's turn, and they list the cards that they can attempt to cancel. White cards are dual purpose, either use on your turn or respond to an enemy attack. I'm just going to hold these up again so you can admire the card art. Now, the awesome thing about these is the Allied deck shows Allied aircraft advantaged over Axis. The Axis deck, conversely, shows their aircraft advantaged over Allied. So it's easy to get very distracted by the sheer beauty of the, these cards. Um, but I'd recommend paying attention because dogfights can be rather fast and furious and you need to know what's going on. As extra chrome, it's not just about dogfights, there are campaign missions. You can fight specific campaigns, in this case this is the card for Operation Pedestal. So once you get used to the dogfights, you can then introduce bombing missions. Um, you can play as either the Axis or the Allies. You can launch attacks against specific geographical or naval objectives. And here are some examples of the things you can target. So these are the target cards for various naval targets. That is their defensive capability, how much damage you can inflict on them and what score you get for doing so. And these are beautifully evocative because the period photos are absolutely brilliant and a wonderful way of just giving you something visual to look at while, while you're attempting to blow it up. There's an awful lot of chrome. For those of you who like your ace pilots, you can equip your aircraft with aces. I don't know if the camera is going to focus, but this is uh, Frantisek, I believe, uh, one of the aces on the British side during the Battle of Britain. 
the early war, particularly allied propensity for flying in three plane sections is represented here. So you are bound by rather rubbish doctrines until you get slapped about a bit and then you learn that these are really not a good idea. The worst, of course, is if you have inexperienced pilots flying in section, you really pay for that. And lastly, of course, aircraft can carry bombs if they're permitted to, or even torpedoes. So you have some say over the weapon load your aircraft carry. So the great thing about this game is you can take as much or as little from it as you wish. Uh, I think it's absolutely beautiful to look at. I think it's really awesome to play. And the next time I do a video, which as I say will hopefully be a live stream so you can see a full campaign mission being played, you'll be able to see what I mean about how brilliant this system is. And of course, while Blue Yonder has only been in print for about four or five years, you can still find it. It's not that expensive for what it is. Um, I'll put a link down in the description for GMT Games so you can go straight to their website. Um, give it a whirl if you are an aircraft aficionado with a particular love for the Second World War. Um, if you just like beautiful pictures of planes, there's a game attached to them. It's brilliant. Can't recommend this highly enough, but don't take my word for it. See how it plays through in a bit. Thank you.